Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're gonna have some rusty crusty fun It's time to talk about damage and weathering and rust and everything cool on our giant Nurgle night Let's get into it uh, The strict technomancer that is Vinci V Let us get to the technique and learn it Vinci V style So as I mentioned I'm continuing to work on my big Nurgle renegade night and now it's come time to actually start applying some, I don't know, nurgleness. So here's how the armor looks right now. Perfectly fine, boring, it's clean, you know, looks nice. We did all the work on a bunch of different freehand and stuff like that. We've got all our little symbols in place. Spent hours and hours and hours doing all these little decals and freehand and all of that. And now it's time to ruin it all. Let's have some fun by messing this stuff up with some weathering. Weathering is really fun, as is adding damage and rust and all of these things. It makes things like machines feel more real and credible because they don't self-heal. They're not like a living organic being where wounds will sort of fix themselves over time. And instead, they make it feel like it actually lives in the world where scratches happen. We've all had a car that might have had some rust or scratches or dings in it. But with Nurgle, we can go a step farther. This presents us a unique opportunity to really mess this thing up. So I'm going to take you through all the different weathering and rusting and damage and stuff like that that we can do. Chipping, scratching, hashing, dashing, dots, the whole deal. So that you can see how you attack these techniques. So, let's get over to the desk. Let's start painting. The first thing we're going to do is going to be some traditional sponge weathering. Now, Nothing wrong with this. It's a very simple technique. It's very organic and very random. You do not have a lot of control. We want to get something like a sponge, usually a nylon sponge, as opposed to something a little more that, that's actually more like soft and absorptive. And we're going to dip it into some very usually dark brown paint. Um, so something like a Rhinox hide can be excellent for this or Pro Acryl black brown, but any dark brown will work. We're then going to wipe off a lot of that paint. We want very little on there, and you need to sort of rotate the sponge around to make sure you're getting it properly cleaned. Once you've done that, test it on the back of your hand or something similar, and then we start sponging over the model. If you don't immediately see a lot of little dots, that's a good thing. You don't want it to be big and chunky and suddenly to have a big splotch on there, which is what will happen if you don't remove enough paint first. So make sure you dab heavily on your paper towel or similar before you start dabbing. Once we're dabbing, we just dab all over the thing. Now, the first place I see people go wrong here is that they just evenly dab the entire model, just like as though they're trying to completely disperse these around the model. That's what our stupid human brains want us to do. We like things to be nice and even. That's not how damage and this kind of chipping would occur in reality. It will focus more on edges. It will focus more towards the lower areas of models, towards where things would naturally impact the model. So what I mean by that is here on this night, I'm going to do a lot more sponging and repeated applications around the lower parts of the legs, the knees, the outside the edges of the arms, the very top front of the carapace, then I do the back or the backs of the shoulders or so on, where the model is much less likely, or the thing, if it were in reality, to encounter damage, bullets, weapon scrapes, bumping itself up against rocks, and so on and so forth. So there should be a method to the madness, and the easiest way to do this is to simply think logically about the model existing in the world. Picture it, walking around. Where does it get shot? Where does it bump into things? Where does it scrape its legs while walking around? Focus your, your chipping in those locations. But you want to use multiple applications, just really build it up over time with lots of simple sponging over these areas. You can also use a couple different colors. Um, it doesn't all have to be the same intensity. So here I use both a dark brown and I end up using a slightly lighter brown. So here I use the warm brown from Pro Acryl. And I kind of then focus in on the areas where I've already applied more heavy dark chips. I then go in and start dabbing around randomly some lighter chips, some of which will overlap, some of which won't onto those same areas of more intense damage just to add some more visual interest and tonal variation. Okay, now that we've done the sponge weathering, that's given us a map. That map lays out where it is, but we're going to go in and reinforce this. So now it's time to take the exact same colors, that dark brown, 
uh, or medium brown, whatever we've used. And we're going to go in and we're going to basically start using those little dots like a map. We're going to play connect the dots. That's really all there is to it. But we're going to focus in on the areas where water or other types of material would naturally gather. Where would larger chips occur? Where would larger scrapes, weapon blasts, things like that hit this thing and cause more significant damage? Again, it's always important to picture in your head the story you're telling. So like towards the bottom of panels or around uh, areas where like there's one layer of metal on top of another. Bolts, rivets, things like this where water will naturally gather, build up, and then soften and eat away at the paint and cause rust. That's where we're going to focus these larger splotches. But we're going to start connecting these little dots into these larger splotches. And at the same time, we're also going to make these sort of uh, staccato lines that show like scratches of something that's traveled across the surface. And the important part here is to stop your brain from doing what it wants to, which is again, make everything symmetrical and even and dispersed. Can't do that. That will ruin the credibility of the damage. It has to be random, but random in the right way. I think that's why so many people find this challenging. So for example, when you're doing these long scratches across things, they can't all be of the same size. There's got to be one that's sort of very big and runs across almost the whole shin. And then you want a couple smaller ones and then one really tiny one, right? So they need to be widely varied in their size and application. That's one of the most important elements in credible damage. Whenever I look at somebody's battle damage and I see that they just have a bunch of scratches that are all the exact same size, you know, they're all basically within one to three millimeters of each other in length, fake instantly fake, ruins all credibility. Varying the size, both the length and then the width and the scratches. That's why I'm using this staccato pattern to sort of show that the chips vary in size across there. As the bullet hits the surface, it would kind of skip along and, and cause different amounts of damage as it kind of tears and bounces and skittles, you know, skitters off the armor, right? So we do that across the entire surface of all these armor plates, but again, focusing more on the areas where there would be more damage. Now we can still hide a little bit of this in those other areas. You don't want to go zero to one. It's not as though there's a bunch and then none, especially on a Nurgle model, it's going to be quite frequently dispersed around. It's just a question of how much, of degree. All right, next up, it's time to actually build in some light. And this is what makes this feel very realistic. Effectively, we're going to sort of underline some of these scratches and hashes with the light catches that the peeled paint would create. Basically, as this, uh, as this sort of uh, rust or whatever, this bullet or this damage happens and the paint peels away, it's now sitting at an, at an outward angle. And as a result of that, some light's going to come down and hit that and catch. That's our light catch. And it helps sort of create more alternations of light, dark, light, makes the thing more credible and increases the amount of visual noise and uh, just makes it look cool. So we're going to go in and under some, 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 some of these uh, chips and damages and rust patches, we're going to then underline away from the light. So you're putting it on the opposite side of where the light is. In this case, the light is coming from up above, right? It's a pretty standard lighting scene, just top down. He's a knight standing out in the middle of a bright, sunny day. So on the bottom of the chip, you'll see is where I'm placing the lights, right? Um, now you'll notice I trace when I'm, when I'm tracing along the bottom of these, I once again use a staccato pattern. I'm not trying to draw a line. I'm trying to tap in, stipple in a little line. Just tap, 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 little tiny lines. I'm catching some, not all, of the sponge chips. I'm going through and giving them a little dot on the bottom and so on. And you can see how as I move this around, then the mix of some of them having light catches and some of them not, some of the scratches having well-defined light catches and some of them not, helps create a more realistic impression of the overall surface. Because what it's doing is uh, making, uh, it's showing us more variation. Not every chip is to exactly the same depth. Not every split of the paint it creates the exact same light catch. Creating that incredible variation is how we build up these layers and how we make our paint job ultimately credible. We can also take this same lighter color paint and just kind of do small dots and hashes and scratches as well with that.
And in both cases, I'm just using a slightly lighter shade than whatever I'm working on. So on the greens, I use a slightly lighter green. On the white, I use a slightly lighter white. But I can do the same thing with just general scratches. Not every scratch necessarily cuts all the way through the paint. So adding a few small other little scratches with the lighter color, just some dots and hashes uh, scattered around, yet again, focus to the area where there would naturally be more scratching, also helps create that variation of damage. So some scratches are just dense, very light, very minor scratches in the paint. Some are huge rust spots where I took a major hit and hasn't been repaired, and everything in between. All right, this next trick is something I don't think you often see in weathering videos, but for me, it's pretty important. So rust, when it kind of spreads out, it will often water will hit it, it will spread out, it will sit on the open paint for a little while and then evaporate. And that tends to create a sort of staining in the localized area. Now, we're going to tackle that in a couple of different ways over the course of this. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get out some pigment, just some raw brown pigment, a rusty colored pigment. And I'm going to basically tap that area around where, not everything, but a couple areas where I have more significant damage. And I'm going to tap on some of that pigment. And when you initially, when I initially do this, you're going to be like, oh my God, he ruined it. No, we didn't. It's fine. It's just dry pigment being tapped onto something. And so I tap it in there and then I blow it away and use the brush to wipe most of it away. What I'm trying to get is a very slight haze over a couple of these areas where it looks like there's some very, at, at almost a micro level, slight staining of where this rust has spread out. This is such a minimal step, but it's very fast because it's just tapping on some dry pigment and then blowing it away and wiping with your brush. It takes like literally five minutes to do this over the entire night body. And yet it's so impactful to the overall feel because you, what you don't want is the rust to feel like a tiny island and then all of a sudden all the paint right next to it is perfect and shiny and clean. Like horrible rust, perfectly clean. I see people make that mistake a lot and again that just ruins the credibility, right? The rust will tend to spread, it will tend to have some minor effects, it will tend to discolor the area around it, and this is the first step in us selling that reality. I've mentioned water a few times in this and where water builds up, and of course we can't have water build up without our favorite thing, streaking. So now we're going to do some streaking on this model. There are so many ways to do streaking. In this case, I'm going to do it all with acrylic paints. You can use oil paints for streaking. You can use enamel paints for streaking. There's grime specifically for streaking. There are a thousand products for this. I'm going to show you how to do it with simple acrylics and contrast paints. I'm going to use a couple different things, both normal paints, contrast, the whole deal. Okay. And you see what I'm using here. I'm also going to use some noosh. That just helps me erase. It basically, this allows you to erase it. It makes your paints act a little more like an oil paint. This is noosh from Procryl. It's very useful for this kind of task. But to be clear, not strictly necessary. You can do everything I'm going to do without it, but it does make it a lot easier. The key with doing streaks is you want to work very thin and very sharp and build up repeatedly over time. So I'm going to use a series of different paints and colors here, thinning first my warm brown and my dark brown out with some noosh, and then applying those streaks and then wiping them, kind of wiping them away, thinning them and smoothing them. And then I let it dry and I do another application. But each time I'm doing another application, I'm not covering the same amount of space. The real key here is that each streak should be in a slightly different place, be a slightly different length, be offset slightly, okay? Because each time water runs out of this rust patch and dries, it's not gonna be the exact same amount of water or in the exact same place. So you want them to be constantly overlapped. As we build this up over time, we're going to show the, the, the effect of multiple rains, multiple streaks, multiple evaporations, where it's left this staining effect. And where they all overlap is where we'll get the strongest streaks. Now, I also am going to use some contrast paint here, very thin. These are great for this purpose. Contrast paints are perfect for this because they naturally shrink a little bit on a flat surface on their own. So they actually create quite a realistic stain. They're a great tool. Anything in the sort of brown or orangey range from the contrast paints can be fantastic in streaking. Um, but in this case, I'm just using this one. Again, this is for doing a little wider colors, uh, a little wider streaks, sorry. Uh, and I just keep layering them over each time. I take it slightly different lengths slightly different thinness or, or you know how wide the streak is right 
and then layering over top. Finally, I go into some actual orange because bringing in an orange tone is really essential to selling that streak, especially over white. And again, I just keep doing that. Whenever I work more intensely, more thickly, I'm making the streak smaller. The most intense parts of the staining would be closest to the damage it's leaking out of because that's where the most water would happen. If only a little bit of water leaked out, the streak wouldn't be very long and it would dry. So that's where you get the most intense stains. I'm always working here with a very sharp brush and just putting these streaks on top of each other, slowly layering them up, effectively just working thin, working my way around the model, letting it dry, doing it again, doing it again. This works especially well on things like tanks and these larger models that have wide, flat surfaces that are perpendicular to the ground where gravity is going to have the strongest effect. If you've got a surface that's mostly flat or upward facing or something like that, you don't generally have to apply streaks to that because they just won't really run out like that. Water will just pool and sit. So instead you're going to get more rust patches or something like that as opposed to traditional streaks. All right. Now that we've got the streaks on, it's time to filter our rust. So this is part two of what we were doing earlier. And this is really easy. We effectively take a very thin wash. So you can use, um, like I'm here, I'm going to use some Army Painter sepia tone, but you could also use um, some Seraphim sepia from GW. You could use a contrast paint. You could use an ink that you just thin way, 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 way down. Any of that stuff. You could even use a very thin brown paint, but inks are because of their because they're transparent, they often and just have liquid medium are easier. But I'm thinning this way down to a filter, and again, over some of these areas of uh, higher amounts of damage, I'm just, you can see, swirling, sweeping, and wiping some of this into the area. This is very thin, very, very, very thin of an already thin thing. And I'm doing this again to stain the area around the rust. So it makes it so when that water would splash out and bead onto the other areas, you would see it leave behind some dirt, some detritus, some of that rust color, and it's just depositing it into the sort of micro imperfections in the surface of the actual thing in reality. So there would be this staining because it, the thing in reality isn't going to be a perfectly smooth, glossy surface. There will be these imperfections that allow the basically particles in the, uh, the dirty particles in the world to sort of latch onto and stain. That's what this captures. Again, very quick step, very minor, but really has a huge effect on your overall impression of the dirtiness of the model. Last up, verdigris. So here we have our copper parts. I had to go and do all of the actual copper edges, but now you can see how we actually build this up. I'm going to work in this set of colors here. So this is everything from sort of a very dark color up to a very light traditional, the sort of nilic oxide and a verdigris color. And you'll see as I work this up, it's important that you actually do have a full panoply of these colors. When things like copper or, or anything like that, when they oxidize and hence turn this verdigris color, they're going to do so again in the logical position. So you'll see how I often group this around things like rivets and so on. Now I start with the darkest color and I work thin, just trying to stain the area and sort of lay down that tone. It's going to end up being my control, what I use to soften other parts of the weathering. When this sort of deep turquoise hits the sort of orangey red of the copper, it turns a fairly dark blackish color with just a little hint of that turquoise still showing that feels like a very natural verdigris. I then am going to build it up, layering through the lighter colors, and as I do so, I cover less and less space, each time leaving a little bit of the old colors, but also not just doing a flat layer, you'll notice I have a very stipply, stabby, hashy technique. I'm also going to occasionally just do streaks with the lighter colors here on these surfaces. The verdigris would be streaky just like anything else. And in fact, sometimes I'll carry that verdigris, especially if it's on a rivet or something, down from off of the copper and bring a verdigris streak down onto the actual non-metal surface because it would be liquid and verdigreed and then run down from the metal, uh, from the metal edging down onto the actual plate and leave behind that green stain. 
So even though that part's not copper, as the water runs onto it, it will deposit that verdigris colored staining there, uh, which is basically just small flecks of, of oxidized copper into that area. So as I build it up, I then stipple. Now I can work back and forth here. I can go back to my darker turquoise color and sort of smooth out any edges or anything if I want or kind of stipple around if there's any transition that looks odd or is too sharp or something like that. But I effectively just build up until I get to that light color. Now, with things like the nilic oxide from GW, my main goal here is going to be to use that to like ring the rivets to hit in recesses and to oxidize those places where it would naturally gather. So I'm focusing here on things like ringing around the sides of rivets or other areas where the copper might have a, um, a more recessed type of application and you want it to run really freely down in there. Uh, it's a great final step. It's also really good for doing the actual dripping streaks. There we go. Bit of a long video, but here's how the, the plates are looking right now. Uh, seems pretty cool, um, but obviously we've got a long ways to go on this one. So all in all, uh, I hope you keep finding this night project I'm working on very helpful. This is a big project for me, and I'm not going to lie. These nights always take a while. These are like two, three hundred hours worth of work for me to do these things. So I appreciate you coming along on this journey with me. If you're interested in uh, picking up any of the products you saw me use today, you can find a lot of them in affiliate links down below. Um, those are awesome. They help the channel uh, while not costing you any extra money. So if you want to pick any of that stuff up, all the links are down below. But if you liked this, give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating. We will be continuing with this project if you want to see the night finished, but we're also going to be, of course, uh, doing new videos here every Saturday on all types of painting. Hope you'll come back and join us. If you want to support the channel, as I mentioned, those affiliate links are a good way to do so, but there's also our Patreon. That's focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. I thank you so much, though, for watching this one. If you've, I've got, if you've got any questions I didn't answer, drop them down below. But as always, we'll see you next time.